tēnā koe tei. Te mea tu tei māku, tei toko ngā kōruro, kōruro mai tei i runga te marae nei. Te mea tu tei ka huri ngā whakāro ki te runga lau ahi manā ki a tātou ku tei mai i runga tēnei kaupapa e karangi hi ai tātou ku hui hui mai tēnei wānō reira tēnā koe tu katoa. Just as a matter of interest, how many people have ever heard of Ngā Whenua Rāhui? Yeah, that's the little survey I'm doing because it's been going for 26 years now and, and most Māori had never heard of it. And the whole kaupapa of Ngā Whenua Rāhui, what was happening up north? Uh, you know, the families wanted to keep the bush on their land but they were getting rated for it. And the only way they could pay their rates was to sell the land. And, uh, and you've probably seen that happening around here. It was actually illegal to force Māori to sell, sell land to pay rates, but it was normal. That's how it happened. And so, um, so Ngā Whenua Rāhui was set up to provide the resource to allow Māori landowners to retain their land and to look after what was there. And not just the Ngā Here, but also the Rewa and all those sorts of things like that. And so over the years, we're talking about 180,000 hectares of modern land that's under <coughs> Tawanata. And the whole purpose of that Tawanata is to ensure that the owners retain the tinu rangatiratanga over their land. So even though I work for DOC, sometimes I wish I didn't because sometimes they say bad things about DOC. Um, the managers of the land that's under Kawanata are the people who belong to the land. And our job is to help to provide the resources to make that happen. But my actual job is about uh, Mataranga Kuratao. Anyone heard of that fund? Uh, that was set up, as you know, listening to Maru talking, you know, um, every time there's a tangi, we lose one of our uh, pākeke, a whole lot of knowledge goes with it. And so how are we going to make sure that that mātauranga that they hold, you know, if Anaki Whenua, hey, we're talking about the environment, how are we going to make sure that that knowledge continues to live on after those people? So how are you going to learn the things that Maru is talking about? You know, we should have a whole day to listen to Maru because once he starts to talk, he starts to weave things together and then we know where we connect. Um, and, and so that fund was set up to help to make that happen. Um, and my job is to try and actually manage that fund. But we never quite worked out. It's been <laughs> okay. Um, um, Exactly. What do we mean by mātauranga as it relates to the environment? And so the definition that we are sort of working to is it's the knowledge of people uh, of the land by the people who belong to the land. You know, if my um, colleague Māori Tapo was here, he would be stirring like anything. Um, you know that Māori don't own any land in New Zealand? We don't own land, because how can, you know, you look on the back of my, my jacket there, you know, ngaro ngaro he tangata toitu he whenua. So, okay, so I'm a, I'm a billionaire and I own that land, and then I die, but the land's still there, and all I am is, these days you get cremated, they blow, are blowing in the wind, you know. <laughs> you know, we can't own land, but we can belong to it. And that's one of the big fallacies. See, Maui is going to talk about uh, colonisation, you know, um, if you sort of put the right, right words around things and if you agree to, to support those words, even if they're wrong, uh, you can say anything. You know, and, and so Mataranga Māori is the knowledge of the land grown by the people who belong to that land over a long, long time. Now, some other fallacies that you find in the book Māori never migrated to New Zealand. The people that came here weren't Māori, they were Pacific Islanders. And they became Māori by being here. Because you can imagine when they got here and found, once they started eating all the big, you know, Kentucky Fried, you know, the moa and all that sort of stuff. You know, how did they get on when there was no coconuts? 
you know, what do you think happened the first time they saw snow? They had to change their whole way of living because of the land. And they learned to live here, not by going to the University of Waikato. <laughs> they sat there and they listened and they were taught by the land. When I started to learn uh, the wrong words back in Whanganui, I'm, I'm really from Whanganui. It's a great place. That's a, that's a great river there. You know, the Whanganui River is the only river that flows upside down. That all the mud's on top and it's clear underneath. <laughs> you know, um, they say, we don't have to tell you anything about the plants in terms of the wrong one. All you have to do is to get to know the plants and they will tell you everything you need to know. <coughs> and for a long time, I thought that was an excuse not to tell me anything. <laughs> but in actual fact, that's what it is. And I'm sure when Tarato starts to talk about uh, the wrong one a little bit later on, that's what she'll be talking about. Because you don't say, you go to a book and it says that you use kawa kawa for such and such, and so you get for kawa kawa. If someone comes to you looking for the wrong one, you, you don't look up your book, you look at that person, you have your karakia, you go into the bush, and sometimes you come out with something you never expected, because that's your connection. And, and the whole thing about Mātauranga Māori is, it's the knowledge that we need to keep the land well. Because if we are well, if the land is well, we can be well. And you can take with Lake Rotorua with all the paru that's in there at the moment, you know, Māori petitioned government, this is Te Arawa, not to release trout. How many people are fishing trout? Legally fishing trout. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it, oh, yeah, what did I do this time? Yeah, um, because I said, if you put the trout in there, they're going to eat all the, all the white bait. What's the name you use for white bait here? Inanga uh, also. You know, and then if they eat that white uh, inanga, what are we going to eat? Because there used to be thousands and millions of them, you know. But see, what happens is that there used to be millions of kākahi in the lake. Anyone eating kākahi? Yeah. Um, they're not the tastiest food in the world, but they, but they are food. I remember talking to one of the old fellows <laughs> saying to me that there's a fern called uh, pupu, pew which is crown fern. And, and you can eat the centre of it. And I said, have you eaten that? And he said, oh yeah. We got, got stuck by the weather hunting. We never had any kai, so we had to eat this. And I said, what did it taste like? He said, it tastes like food. <laughs> I mean, when you're hungry, you'll eat anything. You know, and, and the kaki, to me, I've never really got on to them. But the lake used to be full of kākahi. And what happens is the kākahi are filter feeders. And so when the paru comes into the lake, they take out the paru and spit out clean water. And the way that the kākahi uh, breed is when the little baby ones hatch, they attach themselves to a little fish that swim on the bottom of the lake. And, that, and they carry the, the, the kākahi babies around the lake and then they fall off and then they grow into shellfish. So when the trout came along and ate up the inanga, uh, the kākahi lost their taxi, and so they couldn't spread anymore, and so the lake lost its, 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 cleanser, its cleaning department, which is the shellfish, and now you have a paru lake that you can't swim in. Now the old people knew that, but no one took any notice of them. And so in actual fact, What's beginning to happen now, now that the environment is stuffed up, and if you work with the rongwa, you'll know, you'll know how bad it is, because the plants we use for the rongwa are the ones that actually are there to heal the land and care for the land. It's worse than Tauranga where I live, but even here, most of your rongwa plants along the edge of the bush, they're not right into the bush. I mean, the mananoa is right in the bush, but most of them are not. And they are the ones that actually heal the land after there's been a slip or after there's been a fire or whatever. And they bring the land back so the forest can return. You know, Now, if they're not there, the land will fall to pieces. 
And that's what's happening because you go to the edge of the bush in most places of New Zealand um, and you'll find that um, all you get is weeds or you find that the goats and around here, the wallabies have eaten everything and there's no little more. So how is the actual, how is it going to be well? If the room was disappeared, the healing's gone from the land, the land can't heal itself. You know, so our mission as people in our generation, and no matter how old or young, or young, what we've got to do is help to make the land well. Um, Maru was talking about the maramataka. I've got stacks of maramataka at home from all different parts of the country, and there's quite a bit of variation because that's the marmataka that belongs to different places. Mātauranga Māori doesn't belong in a book, you know. Um, we think these days, and because I'm not as young as I was and all this computer stuff confuses me a bit, they, they think that I'm a bit useless uh, because I can't operate... Uh, um, tried to work Skype the other day and that was a bit of a... <laughs> it would have been easy if I hadn't have been there, should we say. Um, you know, and all this sort of stuff, every, every entry I put into my ngāwhu, and my tāranga kūrataya file, I've got to go through 26 steps or something and play around with all that. Oh, you're useless, eh? Kūware o kitena. You know, go and get a later model, shall we say. We have been conditioned to believe the only way we can learn is through books and through technology. How did the old people pass their knowledge on? They didn't have workshops. They didn't have PowerPoint. You learnt by working with them. You learnt the maramatanga, maramataka by actually working with the land and seeing how it made sense. And so you adapted your maramataka to the place where you lived. And you changed your whole way of doing things because you were in touch with the world that you belong to. See, how many people got a veggie garden at home? Not too bad. You know, most New Zealanders don't know how to grow kai. You know, most people wouldn't survive without a supermarket. We are completely out of touch and we don't realise... You know, I try to say to people, you know, the bush is stuffed. Really it is. Oh, come on, there's trees all over the show. You know, you say to those fellows up, why mana, how come it floods all the time? And, you know, the way that the water works is that when the land, the rain comes down and falls onto the trees, it dribbles down the trunks onto the ground and all the little taru taru, you know, the ferns and the seedlings and the vines and things, and all the mulch, all the dead leaves and branches on the ground hold that water and it trickles down through the soil into the, they call it aquifer, into the big water underneath and that's what feeds our springs. What happens with our bush these days is that um, the deer and the goats and the wallabies and the possums and everything have really stripped the bush the rain comes straight through these days. It doesn't get slowed down by the leaves because the leaves have been eaten. There's nothing on the ground because all the ferns and the seedlings have been eaten. The mulch has been trampled into nothing. So the water hits the ground, runs straight off the ground, doesn't trickle into the soil. That's why the springs are dying. You know, you go up Papamoa Hills, and I've been up there with, the, with Moto and them, and we say, where were the springs? All the springs have dried up because the aquifer is not getting fed, because the rain is rushing down the hills into the stream, carrying the good soil with it. Uh, you get a flood, and then actually uh, all the little streams dry up and there's nothing in there, and all the fish have got nowhere to go. You know, all of those connections that make the land well have been lost, and it's our job to bring them back again. Sound about right? Now, one more thing about growing gardens, and this is something that, that um, someone reminded me of the other day. You grew a garden 
to give it away. You know, um, there was, um, you know, murder was regarded as being a bad thing but in the old days, but there were times when it was justified. And one reason why a person could be killed uh, was because they were selfish. You know, and there's a story in Tauranga, if you've been up into the Opoyaki block, there's a waterfall, Terere or Oturu. And Oturu was a, was a guy married to someone from what is now Ngati Hangaro, and he'd go up in the bush, have a good feed, then he'd come back with all the skinny eels and kereru to feed to his wife and kids. And her brothers started to get a bit hoha because he was this big fat fella with a skinny wife and starving children, and so they followed him into the bush. And they found that he was up there having a real banquet by himself uh, and bringing very little back for his family. So they chased him and he fell down the waterfall and was killed. Selfish people, in actual fact, uh, were regarded as being uh, uh, unwanted, shall we say. And so these days, if you want to become really rich and famous, you get a good job, you buy your flash car and you show off. The mark of a rangatira was a person who could provide for his people. Now that's what we have to learn. You know, the, I mean, I can remember the days when, when the old people would have huge big gardens. The garden would be for the, for the marae. The garden would be for all their kids spread around the countryside, or around the, you know. Um, and the garden would be for those people in the community that were too old or sick or didn't have someone to grow for them. And there was always enough for, for themselves and for those around them. See, these are the things that we've forgotten. And, and these are the things that Maramataka is about because, um, you know, Wira Mutafi from Whanau Apani wrote a beautiful book on, on Maramataka. We can get all those books, but we've got to make that knowledge live by the way that we live. The richest person is a person that gives away the most. The wisest person is a person that shares what they know. You know and, and those that we've got to do. And so, you know, going back to this colonisation things, you know, when I was working at Waikato University, the university called it was, you learn all this, you go to our management school, best management school in the Southern Hemisphere, and the world's your oysters, and you'll have everything that you want. You know, the old people never sent their kids to university to make them millionaires. The old people sent them there to bring that knowledge so that the community could thrive. So we've got to stop about thinking about ourselves and start, number one thing, the earth is your mother. Look after her. Remember, this is back in my priest days, I was out there weeding my garden one day and one of the kaumata from the river, Wanganui River, came past and I said to him, Oh, hey, Kai, I suppose you're a bit brassed off with me. You know, a lot of, um, a lot of people in Kahungunu that needed a priest, you know. And so here's me out weeding the garden. He says, no, no, no. He said, you're looking after mother. Every man's got to look after his mother. A man that doesn't look after his mother is just a bloody mongrel. <laughs> so how many of us are mongrels, eh? I was really thrilled to walk in this room here and... and, and with your, your, your uh, envelope of stuff, paper, because that, that's good. No plastic. You know, the crisis isn't global warming, the crisis is global pollution, and we are looking after it. You know, now when we start to live that way, then we can listen to the maru capsules of this world and learn from them. Because you don't study. Mataranga Māori, you absorb it. You absorb it by your connection to the whenua, you're working with it and you notice it. And if you want to learn the rongua, I'm pleased all the people from the Wānanga here, I mean, the, the rongua is a journey that you spend your whole life. And they're introducing you, and they're putting you through that door so that you can keep learning. Your learning is not from the books that you, that you receive or the wālanga and the powerpoints that you see. Your, your learning is you walking into that ngāhere, getting to know those plants, talking to those plants, listening to those plants. Then 
you will start to understand what the rongua is because the rongua isn't the fact that your blood pressure is down to whatever it should be or your sugar levels are way, way down. You know, rongua is the fact that you are at peace with yourself and harmony with your world. You give and you receive. You are rich and that warmth is the gift that you bring to the world that you belong to. Now that wasn't what I wrote down on these papers, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but you know, but, but, but the thing is about, about it is, you know, um, you, are, you are very important people because you are people that are building that connection. You know, the Waitangi report on uh, Y260, the flora and fauna, and what uh, Joe Williams, the judge, said, you know, um, Māori, Māori tonga grew out of the whenua. If Māori lose connection to the whenua, they will lose their culture. You know, and that's where we've got, we've got to go back to the earth, go back to the ground, make it grow, and then we will really know who we are. So, um, hope that's sort of useful. useful. I'm, I'm used to talking for two or three days, and so... <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and the thing is, um, you don't you go in the bush and then you learn and then the cordial all comes out. But but um, that to me is what Maramataka is about. Um, it does vary a whole lot. You've got to learn from your own old people. Uh, old people grow old and go senile often because no one wants to listen to them. But those people that don't say much, they are the ones of the treasures. And if they can share with you by working beside you then you will become a wise person. Kia ora tata. Just to finish what you were talking about, about the, the quad. Now, um, one of the hapu around the lakes, they've actually, um, they've actually got the quad under protection. And um, I actually learned a little bit about the quad about 15 years ago. Is that when we used to be reeds around the lake, that's where they used to that's where they used to hide. And the reeds were like what you were saying, what the papa he was was a was a sieve. So what I found and I actually put a quad and I actually found a little spawn of those kapahi inside the hills. Oh. And then they what I what I found out and I did a bit of research and then I talked to a scientist and he actually told me what, what happens is that the kapahi gets to a certain size and the quad is closed it out its mouth. Now that we don't have reeds around the lake and they've been gone probably for about 100 years, we don't we still have those fish around. Um, the main parts of the lake that you'll see, the, the kākahi, will be on the east side and around Hamilton. Um So thank you for that. <coughs> see, see, these are the things where we're going to make a difference. Um, you're talking about the pau pau, you know, the, see, we're going to do a wānanga on that lake because all of these things that were part of day-to-day -day living, um, they weren't just useful things, but they're actually about the, about the wellness of the whenua. You know, and... Um, <coughs> you know, so, so that's it. And that's what the Mātauranga Kurutaio Fund is about, is to enable you to, in actual fact, make that knowledge live again. Um, so um, just get your heads thinking. Um, it's not a very big fund, but man, if you use it well, you can actually achieve a whole heap. You know, we don't actually, um, well, some organise, some iwi organisations are really good at getting government money, and 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 that's, that's good, good on them. I mean, you might as well get the pennies worth out of the government. They've taken too much anyway. Uh, but the thing about it is that um, if we've got that fund and use it to work on the grassroots level with our old people, with our people who have really looked after the land, uh, we can learn a whole lot. And, and, you know, the old people learn by watching and what you're saying up there uh, with regard to those kuaro, you know, um, that's, that's something you only learn by watching. You know, and the same with, with the white, there's no crisis in white bait. You know, everyone likes the white bait. All we've got to do is look after the whenua. Because the way the white bait do, they come down to the river mouth at the spring tide and lay the eggs amongst the vegetation. So if you keep your cows off the edge of the river there, then they've got somewhere to lay their eggs. And then you've got to watch out for the mice. Because the mice come and eat the eggs off the, off, off the, off the reeds. So you need a lot of cats. Um, <laughs> don't tell Gareth Morgan. 
you know, but, but you know, all, see, see, the Māori world, see, Māori isn't about some philosophical thing. It's about the connections that bring life. And, and so if you can restore the connections, that, because the whole natural world, everything in actual fact, is connected. And the most important things are the smallest things. So don't think, because I'm not a chief, I'm nobody. You, the little people are the most important people, because that's why the chiefs can stand. And so you restore those connections, uh, like the white bait and the water and so on, you restore Modi, and Modi in actual fact is a source of life. Hmm? Um, the 1080 seems to be a real bad thing in this country. When is that going to come to an end? 1080 is the least of our worries. In actual fact, how many had a cup of tea today? You all had a dose of 1080. In actual fact, 1080 in actual fact is a natural product which some plants produce to protect themselves from things that eat them, you know. Um, we use a lot of stuff, uh, brodificum and stuff like that, which is bioaccumulative, it builds up in the fat in the animals that eat and don't die. And so, for example, your, your brodificum would kill a possum, and then the pig comes and eats the dead possum, and it doesn't kill it, but it sticks in its fat, and then when you go hunting, you go for the fat pigs, you don't want the skinny ones. So you get the 1080 uh, that comes with the fat, and it's okay because you're pretty fat anyway. <laughs> but when you start to get old and you start to get skinny again, then the 1080 gets into your system and you die of rat poison. You know, um, the reason why we have 1080 is because the place is much worse than you think. And the answer it is, you know, if people would stop moaning and get out there and, and, and actually deal with things much better. Like around here, we've just got to get rid of those bloody wallabies, not the ones that play rugby, because they're not much use anyway. <laughs> but, but, you know, because they are eating out all the other long way out of the bush. How many get, how, how hard is it to get a feed of pickle pickle around here? You know, um, you know, for example, if you've got cancer, they give you chemotherapy, which is a poison. 1080 is really chemotherapy for the bush because things are that bad. And we've just got to realise that and fix it. You know, uh, and, and that's it. You know, I hate anything. I hate poisoning anything. But, uh, I mean, it's pretty desperate. Yeah. The rest of the bush is harmed anyway by, yeah. by a man. Yeah. Taking all the rest of the forest away. Yeah. Not the... Uh, yeah. uh, um, the yeah. possible, yeah. people. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. The biggest pest in New Zealand hasn't got four legs, it's got two. And we all moan about dairy farmers. I'm not doing, but, but you know, uh, we, we people cause so much more pollution than any cow ever would. You know. I've just been reading recently about how we are subjected for centuries because of all the wars and bombs that have polluted our atmosphere and our Benua. Uh, it's in every person, every kai we eat. Uh, we have uh, toxins in our bodies now that we can release with uh, old ancient traditional foods like blueberries and wild mangoes and strawberries, any wild berries and foods, actually grab hold of those toxins inside our bodies and remove them. Um, I think I've, I'm actually living proof of this because I pay strong attention to these uh, records of information and I, I've been working on myself on a personal level in this realm. And I'm feeling so healthy today, uh, whereas a year ago I was a mess of food barrier and definitely not well. We all need to get into these wild foods and feed our environment as much as we can with them and engineer and generate them in our own backyards as much as we can. I've got three blueberry plants. It's going to fill a whole uh, cutty for the year. Chuck in the freezer, it'll last for a year. Three blueberry plants. Everybody here should take on that. Take on board that. But what about the berries from the bush, the karamunamu and the mingi mingi and the tawa and the karaka and all those stuff? We've got plenty of fruit here. When the bush is well, we've got plenty of kai. Yeah. Uh,
The actual, this is a, again, we're, we're a wee bit different. The mātauranga that, that comes out of that fund belongs to the people who act. So in Ngā Whenora, we do not want a copy of whatever you've done, except to say you've spent the money well. But the, the actual, the, the mātauranga belongs to the people, not to, not to any government agency, because even if you want to send to us, don't, because... Um, we are a political, politically vulnerable organisation. You know, there are some people within government that would do anything to get rid of Ngā Whenua Rāhui because it's a successful Māori organisation. So, um, yeah. Um, what I'm going to say before, the government is going to say before the Monarchy. I'm one that grew up here in Rotorua. And uh, I've seen the degradation of, um, over the last half century or so, yeah. I've seen the degradation of um, our waterways. Yeah. I've spent my last 15 years over in Tupacua. And um, I've seen what's happening over there. We've got a number one highway that runs right through a massive um, airport. <coughs> um, and the degradation, you know, it looks beautiful and pristine, you know, when you're looking at it. But when you have a close of that, it's yeah. dying. Yeah. Um, when you've got a number one highway that circum, you know, circumnavigates the whole of the the, um, the lake, yeah. um, and it's cutting off the, the job of the therefore from doing its job, you know, we all know that its, its job was to take out all the filter, yeah. filter before sending the water into the, yeah. into the lake. Now. Can we, or how can I, um, fix or remedy other than, other than, um, drive up the road to where you want to go? How can we do that? Now, I, I have seen that out here at Little Eddy, they've got water levels, they've got um, floating wetlands. Um, how can we fix that? Or can we do something about that? You'll find that. You know, with the modern engineering, they're more and more conscious. So, for example, that new motorway down by Tauranga, that was held up for... for we first held when I was on the conservation board 20 years ago. The thing that stopped there was, how could they build a motorway without stopping that water moving through the ground? Because, you know, at, um, at Papamoa, the Wairake stream... Used to, used to be a stream going through there, and a lot of people used to get their flounder and mullet from there, and now it's just a, it's just a, a, a smelly pond. And it's because the railway embankment stopped the water coming underground. So the first thing is that the um, engineers are more and more conscious of that, and their design incorporates the ways of addressing that. The second thing is the Resource Management Act and that allows you to mitigate, to minimise the damage. Now, we've got to say to people, we are not going to accept that anymore. The first question is, how does this affect the wellness of the land? If it actually doesn't, if it does affect it in a bad way, then it's a no. We've got to change our priorities. The most important thing in New Zealand is not economic development, you know, the most important thing is to care for the plenary because that's all of our economy depends on the wellness of our land. Now, what we have to do is really get in touch with our whenua, so because our job as the youngest of Tainese children, we're the Portiki, we are the ones that have the voice to speak on behalf of all our tuakana. But, we, that, but they must not be strangers to us. For most of us, that natural world is a stranger. How many people don't know about the uh, PP Farau or how many people have been out to that uh, bird place out wingspan? They're going to do a wānanga down there to try and get Māori more involved there, because those karere and those ruru and those kahu, those are tong and there's a lot of kōrero on there and we've forgotten about it. Do you know that the karere now lives in town? Now, all those tohu tell us about the wellness of our land and we've got to start listening to them again and be their voices. 
In Maramataka, that is, we are the people who can hear the land talking. <laughs> 